Good evening and welcome to this, uh, our latest Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Alec, I'm the Managing Director of Wound Care People, and I'll be chairing this event for you <coughs> this evening. Uh, first and foremost, thank you all for joining us and giving up your precious time. It does mean a, a, a great deal to us that you're willing to do this, especially on such a glorious day. So this evening's session is Skin Tears, Prevention and Management, and tonight's speaker is none other than the uh, inimitable Karen Uzi, who is the Professor and Director for the Institute of Skin Integrity and Infection Prevention at the University of Huddersfield. You can probably see that we're in our homes this evening. Karen's in Manchester and I'm down here in glorious Cardiff. So do please bear with us if you notice any technical issues. We've done plenty of rehearsals, we shouldn't have any, um, though we're both very conscious that our dogs could join us at, uh, at any moment through the presentation. I'd like to take this opportunity now just to take a, uh, say a huge thank you to Smith and Nephew uh, for supporting the event, in particular to Lely and Alec, who are working this evening and have been doing quite a lot to get this uh, event underway. Um, don't forget, this session counts, towards, uh, uh, counts as towards your CPD for revalidation purposes, and certificates will be available at the end of the presentation. On the right of your screen, you should be able to see lots of uh, uh, options to be able to comment and ask questions. Please do so, because after Karen's presentation, we'll be coming back to do a live Q&A. Have a fantastic uh, evening, and Karen, over to you. Thank you, Alec, and welcome everybody to this session on skin tear prevention and management. I have a huge apology to make to everybody before I start for the awful picture that the kind wound care today people decide to put on of me, which I think may have scared quite a few people. So I shall try and smile and not look quite as dreadful as I look on that picture. So for the session this evening, we're going to look at what is a skin tear. Then we're going to go on to risk factors for skin tear development, leading on to prevention of skin tears, classification, and then management and treatment of skin tears. So we're going to cover quite a lot, but hopefully you will enjoy it. And skin tears is something that's often been overlooked. People tend to think, oh, it's only just a little bit of a tear, nothing to worry about. But as we go through this session, you'll see they can really be quite bad wounds with high levels of exudate and a lot of pain for the patients as well. So what are they? Well, the International Skin Tear Advisory Panel has met quite regularly over the last few years and their most recent consensus document has been very clear at the definition. So they've stated it's a traumatic wound caused by mechanical forces including re removal of adhesives. And the severity may vary by depth, but not extending through the subcutaneous layer. Now that second part is actually really important to remember. So we're going to talk about skin tears, which can be on any part of the body, but they're generally on the extremities. But when it goes through the subcutaneous layer, then what we're probably looking at is pretibial lacerations. And they're quite different really from your skin tears, and they're not dealt with by the Skin Tear Advisory Panel's definitions or in that def consensus document either. So if you want to see the consensus document, it's Kim LeBlanc that's been the lead author on all of these with iStat, and it's available for free download from the Wounds International website and also from the iStat website as well. So skin tears can affect any age group at all. So don't think it's just older people that are more at risk. It can be anybody. So it can be older people, very young people, people with fragile skin, or in fact, relatively healthy people like yourselves and me, who may go out for a jog in the morning, on the evening. Not that I would ever actually go out for a jog, but some people do. So maybe running over rough ground, fall over and then crack the leg open maybe on a stone and that can then cause a skin tear. You know how much they hurt if you do do that and sometimes you think oh, I'll just put a plaster on it which may be all right if you've got really good skin but not so good if you've got friable skin. They're also painful wounds and they can affect quality of life for the patients especially if they're on the lower limb or on the upper limb and you want to wear maybe shorts or you want to wear short sleeve tops because distress the patient as well and in the worst case scenario they can increase the likelihood of hospitalization and prolong hospitalization stays 
And of course, if you don't go into hospital with it, but you're sent home in the, to the community, then you're going to have more nurse visits or podiatry visits if it's down on the foot. So what can cause these skin tears? Well, we've just talked about going out jogging, but also equipment injuries are a lot, happens a lot. So with wheelchairs and bed rails, blunt trauma, poor patient transfers is one of the biggest ones as, as well, falls, inappropriate dressing removal and dressing putting on as well, and normal activities of daily living. Patients will often, well, people with skin tears often say it's been caused when they've been mobilizing, going, getting onto the bus. And you'll know that when you get onto the bus, the bottom step tends to come down, but the second one doesn't. So you put one leg up and you crack your leg onto the second step as well, which can cause damage to the skin. So it can be absolutely anything. And you can see from this image here, quite how severe skin tears can be. So they're not just a minor cut, they can be really quite deep, painful and aesthetically displeasing as well. So how big is the problem with skin tears? And I'm hoping some of you are now thinking, yeah, I see quite a few skin tears, but I don't report them. Tissue viability don't often ask me about them, mainly because I think, oh, they're not that bad, but we don't report them very well anywhere globally. There's been some research in the US and Australia, and the US has estimated around about 1.5 million skin tears that occur in older adults in care homes and nursing homes, with a 0.92% incident rate in elderly care across facilities in the US. So it is actually quite high. In Australia, Carolyn Carver and her team from Curtin University in Western Australia They've reported 16% of the population sustained skin tears each month. And this was in a 120 bedded nursing home, of which 41.5% of known wounds were found to be skin tears in older people in long-term facilities in Western Australia as well. And as you can see there, between eight and 11% prevalence has been reported. Now, all this has been done in Western Australia, but it's very little work over here in the UK or across Europe. So it's something that we really need to be looking at as well. So we need to look at the variation in incidents and it could be a lot of the time it's due to different practices and a lack of uniform method for assessment and documentation of these skin tears being missed. It's quite difficult sometimes for us to be able to assess how big that problem is. So if nothing else from this session, it would be really good if when you go back to your own workplaces, you do start documenting these skin tears and letting tissue viability know as well. Tissue viability teams that are on this Facebook Live at the moment will probably be saying, why have you said that? We've got enough wounds to look at. But there's a great risk of infection if the skin is mismanaged. Now, when we look at pandemics as we've got at the moment, our epidemics, these types of wounds that aren't seen as being too serious are often not prioritised. So consider how many times have you been into a care and nursing home since we've been in lockdown and seen patients with skin tears? Before that, did you give any sort of advice out to care and nursing home staff how to manage skin tears? Are are people knowing how to manage these at home? And have we seen visits to the emergency department or general practitioners being reduced with people with skin tears? We know since this pandemic and this lockdown that there's been less people going to the emergency department. So I would strongly suspect we've seen a decrease in skin tears, but only because we haven't had them reported. So this is an area that we could really be doing shared caring quite easily. So what's the risk factors for skin tear development? Well, anybody that has a history of skin tears, that has friable skin, that's maybe on medication such as steroids, these all affect skin that hasn't actually developed properly in your neonates and obviously your critically ill and the critically ill populations. Again, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we've seen a rise of pain 
an increase in patients going to the intensive care unit, being prone, being turned a lot. The skin's not very good. So there's probably been an increase in skin tears in the ITU units as well. This next slide is slightly busy, but it does show you all the intrinsic and the extrinsic risk factors. You can see there's an awful lot there. Won't go through them bit by bit because it'll just be too much, but you can see that we're looking at moisture associated skin damage caused by incontinence, hormonary problems, vascular problems, visual impairment. Remember, if a patient is maybe blind or has reduced sight, then there's risk of them going banging themselves or in the home, banging themselves while they're outside or falling. History of skin tears and nutritional intake is really important. Also keeping the skin well hydrated. And again, Carolyn Carvel's team over at Western Australia looked at skin tears, as you know, from the slides that we looked at previously about incidence and prevalence. But what they also said is that we should be aiming to moisturize the skin at least twice a day to stop it drying out and therefore reduce the risk of skin tears. So their suggestions and advice are that we moisturize in the morning and in an evening. If for some reason we can't do it twice a day, then to try and encourage at least daily moisturization. One of the biggest things that we see causing skin tears is us as healthcare practitioners removing dressings incorrectly. And it's really important that when we put dressings on, we put them on carefully, make sure they're not too tight, make sure they're the correct size, and that we look at the patient's skin before we choose that dressing. If the patient's skin is very friable, you don't want to put a very sticky dressing on because it is going to damage the skin on removal. Remember, you can use adhesive removers as well to help with that, or maybe look at silicone dressings that aren't going to damage the skin. This is definitely a multi-professional way of working. It's not just our responsibility as nurses or podiatrists, responsibility of everybody to prevent skin tears. So we need to include professional groups such as physiotherapists. So to get them in to do home checks, make sure that there's no dangers and the patient has the correct mobility aids, occupational therapists, and make sure homes are safe and that if we can declutter, patients do declutter. We know that's not easy. Patients don't always want to declutter, but to try and give advice. So how are we going to prevent these skin tears? We know what causes them, we know what they are. So wherever possible, obviously the aim is to prevent a skin tear. So we need effective assessment, planning and implementation. If we can, we need to control modifiable risk factors. So again, looking at nutrition, looking at the environment and explaining to patients and carers as well about how to prevent skin tears. And this prevention is based around three main principles. That's general health, mobility and skin. And if you again, you look at the International Skin Tears Advisory Panel's Risk Reduction Programme, They've been very good and very clear for us to look at those risk factors in detail. And again, you can see they're looking at the multi-professional approach to managing these skin tears and preventing them, but also ensuring that we have this shared care. So with the patient, with the caregiver, with the provider and with families. So we look at general health, make sure we educate the patient. But again, if we're telling patients this is the nutritional status we expect, Look at who's doing the cooking. The patient isn't cooking and maybe the husband, the wife, the daughter, the son is. Then we also need to explain to them what a good nutritional diet consists of. We need to give advice on how to manage BMI so people are grossly underweight or overweight. Mobility we've talked about. So we need to encourage people to be active, but active in a safe way. And to get patients and their carers to look at the skin daily, so to have it just as a routine. We also need to be looking at ourselves, make sure fingernails are short, don't wear jewellery. And if patients, relatives are caring for their loved ones, 
tell them as well about not having long fingernails and removing jewelry as well, because that can be a risk to the patient, as you well know. Look at medication as well and see if the medication can be affecting the, the skin condition and the health of the skin as well. Now, there are a range of classification tools as well that we can use. And there's three main ones that I'm sure many of you have heard of. So there's the pain marking classification system, which was the first system to be developed. There's then the skin tech audit research tool, commonly known as STAR, and then there's the ISTAP classification system. I'm going to have a quick look at these. So this is the pain marking classification tool. This has been out since the 1990s, used by a lot of people, but has been superseded. But it's worth you knowing about these because when you read different documents, different papers, they may well use this tool. Three categories, and it's based on the extent of tissue loss measured as a percentage. And as you can see, some really clear images there. And what they've offered us is a description and how we would manage it. We've also got the classification to the skin tear audit research tool. This is from Carolyn Carville and Silver Chain over in Western Australia. Three categories here. So category one, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B and 3. So it goes from a very minor skin tear that often we think of up to a skin tear where the skin flap is completely absent. So really quite a severe skin tear. And then we have the ISTAP tool. Now, this is the one that I would suggest that everybody uses. So when you see a skin tear, this is how you will classify it. Really quite easy and straightforward to use. So they have classified skin tears in three types. So we have no skin loss. So it could be a linear, a linear or a flat tear, which can be repositioned quite easily to cover the wound bed. Type two is a partial flap loss, which cannot be repositioned to cover the wound bed. And type three is total flap loss, so there's nothing there to cover the wound bed. People have said that they don't actually identify quite what the severity of a skin flap loss is. But if you look at the Payne Martin tool or the STAR tool, you can quite clearly see their definitions that can be used here. When you see the image as well in the type three, you can see it's when they've got no skin and they are really painful. Both the partial flap loss and the total flap loss can cause a lot of pain for the patient. And often it's aesthetically displeasing and it also can reduce quality of life for people. We may be used to seeing a lot of wounds in our daily workplace and we think, oh, this doesn't look much. But if you don't see wounds a lot, seeing this skin being removed from your loved one's arm or leg or your own can be quite distressing. So it can affect the quality of life. So don't ever underestimate these wounds. So if we try to protect the patient's skin, we've given them good advice, but still we manage to see a skin tear occurring. We classify it. How do we then manage and treat it? Well, skin tears, remember, are acute wounds, so they have the potential to be closed by primary intention. Now, we know that when we say primary intention, we think of sutures, we think of staples or adhesive strips, but this doesn't always work for skin tears because often that skin is really quite fragile. They're not generally deep, so we need to be careful not to further damage the skin by using skin strips or sutures. However, what we really need to do is try and preserve the skin flap and maintain the surrounding tissue. So as well as looking at the skin tear itself, remember to look at that peri-wound area. Has that been damaged? If there's excess exudate, we need to manage that as well. Ask the patient about the pain. And generally, like I say, these are really quite painful wounds. If you haven't had a skin tear, I'm sure you've had a paper cut they may be small, but they're really quite painful and a skin test very similar to that. So you're going to maintain the surrounding tissue. 
then reapproximate the edges of the wound without stretching the skin. So don't try and pull it like a piece of plasticine to see if you can get it to cover it again. And we must reduce the risk of infection and any further injury. And don't forget when any wound that we're caring for, we need to remember those principles of antimicrobial stewardship. So we don't want to be using antibiotics if the patient doesn't have an infected wound or have an infection or using antimicrobial dressings, there's no signs of infection there. Antimicrobial stewardship should be in the back of everybody's mind or in fact at the forefront of everybody's mind for any sort of wound that we're managing. So when you're assessing this skin tear, this is what you need to be looking at. Look at the anatomical location and look at the duration of the skin tear. When did it happen? How did it happen? Where did it happen? Is it clean or is it dirty? What are the dimensions of that wound? So what's the length? What's the width? What's the depth? Measure it as per your local policies and guidelines. You may be able to image it or you may just have to measure it with a ruler, but whatever your local guidance says. What's the wound bed characteristics? So is it viable tissue or is it non-viable tissue? And is there any exudate there? And what type of exudate is it? And remember to document all this in the patient's notes. Is there any presence of bleeding or hematoma? And if there is, you're going to have to manage that bleeding, remember. Have a good look at the flap. Is it healthy or is it necrotic? And again, remember, you're measuring all of this, you're assessing it and you're documenting it. And the integrity of the surrounding skin. This peri-wound area is really important and often forgotten about. Make sure your junior staff understand about that peri-wound area as well. Make sure that as, long, as well as assessing the wound itself, look around it. Look for any signs of infection and ask the patient if they have any type of pain. And where is the pain? What does the pain feel like? So is the pain around the wound area or is it in the wound itself? Document all this clearly and report it. And again, if you look at this consensus document by ISTAP, they're very clear with this pathway. And I know this might be quite small, but you can always download it free of charge, remember. So you're going to assess, cleanse, look at the wound itself, document what you can see, and then categorize that skin tear. Is that a type one? type two or a type three. So once you've classified and decided what you need to do, then you must work out what is your main aim of managing that skin tear. If it's bleeding, then you need to control that bleeding. So apply pressure, as you know, and elevate the limb and use appropriate dressings to manage that hemostasis as well. Make sure you document this in your notes and be very clear about what you saw and how you manage it and which wound dressing you used. When you're cleaning the wound as well, clean as per your local policies and guidelines. Things will be different in each trust or each healthcare setting, so have a look what's there. Don't scrub at the wound. You don't want to be damaging that really fri that friable skin any more than it already is. Gently pat around that surrounding area to avoid any further injury, but to dry. The skin flap is viable, then reapproximate it, and you can use a dressing to do that. Make sure your hands are gloved, though, as well, and use silicone strips if necessary. But again, please have a look at your local policies and your guidance there, or speak to tissue viability for what they suggest you should be doing. And of course, we need to manage infection or any sort of inflammation and consider the moisture balance. So you're looking at that time acronym with this, remember. So you're looking at tissue. Is it viable or non-viable? Is the wound infected or inflamed? What's the moisture balance? And look at the edges of the wound and any epithelialization that may be there. So to look, is there any clinical signs and symptoms of infection? And remember, wound infection can result in pain and prolong that healing trajectory, so you do need to manage it. 
have a look as well. If you're not sure about clinical signs of infection, look at covert and overt signs. And I can direct you to the International Wound Infections Institute consensus document on wound infection. That's free to download from their website, but that will actually help you understand the difference between infection and inflammation. Have a look at that wound again. If it's very dry, you need to be adding moisture to it. If it's very wet, you need to be managing the moisture, remember. And document what you see. If you see lots of exudate, document the viscosity of it and the volume of it. And again, like we've said before, look at that peri wound area. What's it like? Hopefully your skin tears should heal within 14 to 21 days. If it's on the lower limb, then please consider compression therapy and have a look at which compression therapy you use and then apply what you think is correct. If you look at the National Wound Care Strategy, they have their lower limb pathway there. Have a look at that. They are suggesting that you can safely apply 20 milligrams of mercury um, on the lower limb without doing an APBI, but please check with your local guidance as well. And when you decide on a wound dressing, as we've said all the way through this, this skin is going to be quite friable. So you don't want to put any sort of dressing on that's going to cause any further damage. So decide what is your main aim. Is it to control bleeding? If so, use a hemostat. So you're going to be controlling your bleeding. You need a dressing that's easy to apply and remove and not cause any trauma at all on removal. Often these skin tears can be in quite tricky places. So you want a wound dressing that's flexible and you can mold it to the contours. And of course you want it to be cost effective and cost effectiveness is a whole different session really. But just remember that just a dressing that is cheap to buy isn't always the cheapest one in the long run. You need to look at how often it needs to be removed how long it can stay in place, and is it comfortable for the patient? If you can leave the dress in place for several days, that will really help because you're not going to be disturbing the skin flap. And you really don't want to disturb that flap. We've been able to reapproximate the edges for about five days. Again, I'm going to send you to the consensus document from ISTAP that talks about this in a lot of detail. There are some dressings though that are unsuitable. One of those skin closure strips, again, you can see from this image here, there are quite a few on that wound. And sometimes these are put on maybe in an emergency situation in the emergency department because you think it's going to keep the flap approximated. Actually, it doesn't. The wound will just bleed quite a lot and they'll all drop off. So they're not the best thing to use and they are not recommended. Please don't use gauze either because that will leave fibres behind. It doesn't secure the flap either and you need secondary dressings. It will also dry the wound out, which can lead to a risk of skin necrosis, which you don't want. And iodine-based dressings, these just dry the wound out. They dry the peri-wound area and these are really a high risk for making that skin tear worse. So don't be using that either. Look at your local formularies and have a look what's on there. And there should be some suggestions of dressings that you're able to access quite easily to manage skin tears. So when you put your dressing on, you will remember when we started, we said be really careful about how to apply a dressing and similarly how to remove a dressing. Once the dressing's on, draw an arrow on that dressing to indicate the way it needs to be removed. Because if I put the dressing on on a Monday, I may not go back on a Friday to change that dressing. It could be a different nurse or a different healthcare practitioner who won't know where the, which direction the skin flap's going in. But having an arrow there makes it really clear. When you come to remove the dressing, if you think, oh, it's going to be a bit sticky, it's going to stick to the skin, it may cause damage while I'm removing, then use an adhesive remover, which will minimise that trauma. And it's not a race, remember, to get the dressings off. 
It's not the fastest person to do it. It's not to use the old adages that your mum or your grandma used to say that this will only hurt for a couple of seconds as they rip the dressing off your leg. Take time to move those dressings slowly to reduce the pain. If the patient complains of pain or is worried, then give them analgesia about 20 minutes, half an hour before you do that wound dressing. If you go into the patient's home, if you can, try and give them a rough idea of when you'll be arriving so they can take analgesia prior to arriving to reduce that pain. You may wish to consider using a barrier product as well to protect the surrounding skin prior to putting your wound dressing on. That'll help stop maceration, especially in high exuding skin tear. Use an emollient to soften and smooth the wider skin area and prevent further tears. And don't forget to educate your patient and their family about use, keeping the skin moist at all times. So using your daily moisturiser, use it either daily or twice a day if possible. And do monitor that wound for any signs of infection. You need to understand the covert and the overt signs. So do have a read up on that if you're not sure about it. If there's no improvement, then please refer to either the GP or tissue viability nurse or medic in charge or nurse in charge if the patient is in hospital. And again, look at your local protocols as well because there'll be some nice clear guidance there for you. There's a range of resources for you for you to go away after this session and after we've done the questions and answers to have a look at, to continue to update your knowledge on skin tears. So it's obviously the ISTAP consensus document we've talked about. There's the International Wound Infection Institute's consensus document on infection to give you a real insight into what you're looking for. Smith and Nephew also have lots of really good resources that are free to use. They've got a digital skin tear toolbox, which has ISTAP and the STAR pathways in there. They have educational presentations and they also have a range of videos that you're able to access. And you can see these on the screen in front of you as well. They're also able to offer to you virtual training, obviously face-to-face -face when we're allowed to be face-to-face -face again, but virtual training at the moment. And they can help in acute settings, but also residential care homes where they can undertake this first aid following pathways and nursing homes where they can help have a standardized process, but also within hospital trusts as well in the more acute settings. And there's also lots of support from YouTube has a lot of videos out there. Wound Care Today website does Tissue Viability Society, European Wound Management Association, World Union of Wound Healing Societies, Wounds International, Wounds UK, there are so many different places you can get free resources at the moment. Please do make use of them. So thank you all very much for listening and I shall hand you back to <coughs> Alec. Uh, thank you, Karen, that was, uh, that was amazing. I've been watching along with uh, the, uh, the comments. We've had over 600 people watching the session today uh, and one I noticed actually watching from uh, Alexandria in Egypt so you've gone truly international this evening so uh, well done. Um, so we've had lots and lots of questions and we've taken just a few of them uh, just to start so we'll start with the first one this is from Alison and Alison asks do you think is do you think it is okay for carers in care homes to care for skin tears? It's a very loaded question Alison Thank you for that. And there's a range of answers. So I think what's really important in care homes is that people are educated as to what a skin tear is. It's more important to prevent than manage. And that's very easy for me to say sat here, but we can educate people about moisturizing skin twice a day. That will help obviously. Good nutrition, especially in a care home but also looking at the environment. So are the bed rails there? If there are, is there anything sticking out? So get rid of that, make them safe. Make sure the bed areas are safe and free from clutter. 
the people there to help patients mobilise as well. So I think in essence, Alison, we can tend to prevent them. Skin tears that we see in care homes as well, hopefully aren't quite as bad as the images you saw earlier. So I see no reason why carers can't, if they've been educated and they've got the correct dressings out there. If it's really bad skin tears, we're looking at total flat loss, then that will definitely need referring to the GP or to get the district nurses in there. Excellent, thank you. I think I probably know which Alison that is, uh, is from as well. Um, question two from Samantha. I'm in a residential care home with no nurses. While in lockdown, uh, are there courses on dressings I could look at to help? What was the name again, Alec? Samantha. Samantha, sorry. I've got um, isolation madness and I can't remember anything at the moment. Uh, Samantha, there are a lot of the companies have got lots of different educational videos on their websites at the moment that you'll be able to look at for dressings. There's lots of best practice documents out there that have um, different information on different types of wound dressings as well. So it really depends what sort of dressing you want. Um, I don't want to be trying to sell anybody's dressings here. So decide, do you want a hydrocolloid, do you want a silicone dressings? And look at the companies that make those dressings. And there'll be lots of educational resources there. Smith and Nephew, as you will have noticed from the slides at the end of the session, they've got quite a lot of resources there and they will have resources about wound dressings as well. Yeah, can I just, uh, can I just add there as well that um, on our JCN website, which is just jcn.co.uk, we have, I think it's 12 different modules, which are generic modules looking at different types of uh, dressings. So, uh, yeah, lots of companies have them and lots of other uh, providers like ourselves have them, but we've certainly got quite a few of them written internally by us, um, available via our JCN uh, website. Um, so question three, can you recap on the use of steri strips and when and why we should use them? Okay, don't use them. Yeah, I was thinking, is that, is that what it yeah. should be? <laughs> Um, they were used in the past quite a lot and we did quite a lot of work. Uh, we did some research down in an emergency department looking at skin tears and pretibial lacerations. And we asked the staff in the emergency department, why do you put all these skin strips on there? And they said for two reasons. One, because it gave them a good chance to sit down with the patients and spend some time with them, which they very rarely get to do in the emergency department but it also made them feel like they'd done something because it stuck that wound back together. And that's not what we're really aiming to do. What we want to do is reapproximate those edges. So when the skin comes off, we want to try and pull it back over and approximate it down and then put a dressing on that isn't going to damage the skin. We shouldn't be using skin strips to stick it back down again. You're going to further damage the skin. They tend to bleed quite a lot, these wounds. And all that happens, especially when it's on the lower limb, you stick all these skin strips on, patient stands up, bleeds like mad, and all the skin, all the skin strips come off. So don't use them. Reapproximate the edges and put a suitable dressing over the top. And compression if it's on the lower limb, if it's safe to do so. Excellent. Um, so we've got question four from Shoban. Um, I think I've said that right. Uh, which is, what type of infections would you be mindful of? Oh, Chopin, any, really. If you've got covert or overt signs of infection, so if the wound's malodorous, if the patient's feeling really quite unwell, if it feels very warm to touch, then be worried about any infection. You can send a swab off if you need to, or you can use an antimicrobial dressing, if there are signs of infection there. So any wound infection, really, you don't want it to take a hold and then obviously it becomes systemic as well. Excellent. Uh, so you've got a couple more. Uh, question five, which is from Yoni. Uh, does the arrow that you put onto the dressing point in the direction of the tear or which direction to remove the dressing? 
Right, so it's which direction to remove the dressing. So if you've prop so you've got your limb here, the skin tear comes across there, and you stick your dressing on. You're going to put the arrow down because you want them to move it downwards. If it was the other way and you pulled it up, all you're going to do is pull the skin tear off. Okay. And would um and this is just from me, just because when you were mentioning that, I was thinking this myself. Would you would it be worth writing pull this way as well as an arrow? Because I was thinking exactly that question as I was listening to you say it, say, say it. Or is that too much effort to actually draw an arrow and say tear this way or pull from think, this corner? Yeah, I think you can write that on, Alec, as long as it's big enough. The wound dressing, yeah. obviously, to write all that on or write it in the care plan to say the arrow is pointing the direction that you need to remove the dressing. Okay. But you're right, because what we we sometimes do things and think it's very clear, but it's not as clear to the next person if you've not explained it to them. So I think make it simple for people. Don't try and make it confusing. People are busy as well, so they don't always have chance to think about what they're doing properly. I put a shed up on the weekend and I couldn't understand the instructions at all. So I think the, the easier you can make it for people, the, uh, the better. Oh, definitely. So we've got a uh, we've got just uh, one or two more. So question six, which is from Charlotte, is are we meant to report all skin tears? Ah, uh, Charlotte, I need to be very careful how I answer this question for fear of being lynched by tissue viability teams. Um, have a look what your tissue viability teams or your local policies say about reporting, but definitely document it all in your care plans and then have a really good care plan of how to assess, manage and treat. I think it's worth, depending which area you work in, if you're seeing, if you think, well, I'm seeing a real, quite a lot of skin tears, is there a reason why? Is it because it's the way somebody's moved in handling the patient, for example, or have you bought a load of new bed rails that actually don't fit the bed very well and are causing skin damage? then I would report it. Many tissue viability teams may not want you to report every single skin tear to them, but definitely document. And if you do think there is something not quite right here, then audit what's going on. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Charlotte. Um, so question seven, is there any general rule on how long you can keep addressing on for? Depends what the wound looks like, Alec, really. If the wound is infected or any signs of infection, then you're going to want to be removing it, well, checking it once a day or once every other day. If the wound looks nice and clean, it's epithelializing, then you can leave a dressing in place for seven days if there's no issues, depending on which dressing you've chosen. So it's very individual, which is why you need to do individual assessments on the patient and be really clear in your care plan and your notes, what you've done, why you've done it, and how long you want to leave it in place. Excellent. Um, so just got two more questions. This is the penultimate question. So question eight is, we don't currently use any of these pathways. Do you have any advice on how we would start to implement them? Um, which care setting is it? Is that an acute, do we know, our community? We, we don't. Um, what I will say is that any questions that we haven't answered, we'll gather up and we'll be able to uh, get answers for them and post them onto our website. So perhaps we can find out who, who asked that question and maybe it'd be worth us coming back to it. Yeah, it will de question. it'll depend. If you haven't got a pathway in place, then it's quite easy to implement it. But I'm not sure where... Where the obviously they're in a care home is going to be slightly different than in an acute setting, then it will be in the district nursing setting. Okay, uh, we'll definitely come back to that when we'll find out where they're where they're based, and perhaps we can get an answer for uh, for both of those settings. So, yeah. um, Karen, this is our final question, and this is from Suzanne. Uh, what should we do if we can't approximate the edges? Do we leave the flap where it is, or do you remove it? Again. Sometimes some people say remove it, some people say leave it where it is. If you can just smooth it a little bit and put your dressing on, but really 
it's probably going to be necrotic and it will die anyway. So refer to tissue viability and let them come down, have a good look and decide what they want to do with it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, so Karen, that concludes our live trading session. I just want to thank you very much again for uh, presenting for us. Uh, it's been the first time we've worked together in a long time. So, uh, and it's been an absolute joy and a pleasure. I want to congratulate you personally for not cussing and also for your dog not uh, jumping up on the screen. I know it's um, been I've good. Been panicking because mine has been next to me for quite some time as well. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank all of the viewers for engaging with tonight's session. We really do appreciate it. And I genuinely mean it that on a day like this evening or an evening like this evening with the weather as it is, it's very easy to just sit in the garden with a glass of wine rather than committing to furthering your own education. Uh, we couldn't have done this without our industry partners and Smith and Nephew uh, this evening have been absolutely fantastic. So thank you to all of the team there. Um, if you've missed any of the session, then this video will be available along with the presentation on our Facebook page and on our website as of tomorrow. So this certificate link should now be on your screen. That's all uh, something that somebody, uh, people are always asking for. So you can download your certificate for your revalidation purposes. Um, thank you from me. Thank you from my team at, uh, at Wound Care People. Um, have a lovely evening. It's still fairly bright here in Cardiff. So I'm gonna go and sit out in the garden and have a glass of wine and get over this. And uh, I look forward to uh, working with you and seeing you all again very soon. Thank you and good night.